Back at it like a crack addict. <laughs> 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 remember us? Like, remember us, the knockoff? <laughs> yeah, 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 shit, man. Hiatus. That uh, very length, lengthiest hiatus we've had to this point, but here we are, we're back. It's the original trio, Briss leading us off, got joined by Danny and Chris once again. I think it ended up being about three and a half weeks that we weren't here, but we're back on deck now. Is this the first edition of 2017 we had, or was there one nah, after New Year's? No, nah, we, we yeah. definitely did one in January That's there right. somewhere. That's it. Well, we've got to, the goal is to try and top that episode back on deck, straight off the top. We haven't touched on any UFC for weeks, boys, and there's been plenty happening in the game. Yeah, they seem to like keep churning out the cards. Um, there's there's definitely been a couple. One last week, which um, God, I don't don't even know too many of the people that were on, but Ovin St. Prue was on that card. Got beaten. Yeah, got beaten. Yeah, got beaten, beaten OSP. Yeah. Like, a guy who was unranked came in and beat the number six ranked 205er. Yeah. Oh, Vince went five hard rounds with John, like a yeah. rusty John Jones at that exactly. too. But any any time a guy comes in who's unranked on short notice that wipes him out, uh, that hurts OSP's stock fucking big time. Absolutely. The, the UFC's two, 205 division seems to be not lacking talent and, and depth, I suppose, but just it really, without John Jones in it, it, it just doesn't sort of seem to make sense. It's crying out for new blood. It's crying it out for a guy who's fought since we last had an episode at heavyweight, Francis Ngannou, the big yeah. Frenchman fighting out of, a Frenchman with a Cameroon background who three years ago was a homeless guy in the streets of mm. Paris, went to a boxing gym and now he's one of the scariest prospects the heavyweight division has seen hands for down. years hands down man he is just for anybody that hasn't seen him like 250 pounds he steps on the scales which is you know he's probably around the 107 kilo mark and just jacked to the tits you know i think he's like six five and just yeah throws heavy leather and has submissions too for, for a guy who's new to the game like that his uh his level is just Frightening. I think he can. He's only a young guy on the rise, and he fought. Uh, if, in case you didn't see that card, he fought ex world heavyweight champion Andre Arlovsky, and it was the classic journeyman fighter against the new bull. And first round, he got put away. So anytime you beat an ex champion, regardless of whether he's on the back nine of his career or not, is enormous for a guy like Francis. And I'm I'm on his back big time. Oh, and be- believe you me, the UFC are going to drive his star something crazy. You know, that they will absolutely put a lot of marketing behind this guy because he is that epitome of what you want as your heavyweight champion. You want that big, angry, scary, jacked-looking Brock Lesnar-style guy that sells pay-per-views because people just tune in to watch a beast that's unleashed. You know? He seems to really be putting in a lot of work on his English as well. He did his post-fight interview, uh, I think it was Anik that was in the cage with him, uh, did all of his post-fight speech in English, which for a marketing thing, there's so it just comes in so handy with how the, big the UFC is across the US when you're talking about going to Vegas for the fight capital of the world going to fight there and you can get on the mic and preach to the, to the crowd in English as well as your own native mm. tongue, comes in so handy. Like you look at a guy like Aldo and that just held him back. Mm. I, I feel it held him back big time. <laughs> Did you hear Joe Rogan was like, uh, I, I don't want him to try and speak English. I want him to come out and scream in French and then just drop the mic <laughs> and walk out. That, that would have, like a guy like that could pull that off too. Yeah. He really would. Like what, what the fuck did he just say? That yeah. was fucking scary. Can but. you imagine like if it was sort of like back to sort of that WWE model where they got someone who was just a big, angry, scary looking dude who was from the Middle East, you know, and, and just mic dropped after speaking Arabic like really violently into mm. the microphone in Vegas in front of a whole bunch of Americans. Mate. Like they could sell the shit out of that because it'd just be like that, whatever Rocky movie that was where they, they you know, the... the the Yanks were currently at the in the Cold War with the Russians or whatever, so they did America versus Russia, Rocky. If we're talking about a heavyweight something, a heavyweight guy from the Middle East, who's to say he's even allowed to fight in Vegas these days? You know what I mean? With that, oh, the way the borders are going, yeah, Gay Gad Musasi, yeah. um, the middleweight UFC fighter, is Dutch, but he was born in Iran. And apparently he's going to have to go through an absolute shitload of paperwork and they're going to have to get a legal team really? to even be able to apply to fight in, oh, in the US really? again. So yeah. He's Dutch, Dutch resident, but he was born in Iran. Yeah. So that's red flags to the Trump administration. That's fucked up, hey. That's some really fucked up shit. On that, uh, on that, we'll probably get into a bit of like old Trumpy boy and that a little bit later on in the, uh, in the piece. But from that card too, last weekend, uh, 
Jorge Masvidal stopped Cowboy Cerrone in in Denver too, which is Cowboy's own backyard, and he bullied Cowboy in that yeah, fight. He yeah. really did. He walked him down, just constant pressure. It was the first time at 170 where Cowboys looked human. And again, it's one of those things where Cowboy only had a win in December. Great coming off, like a great win in that fight. Who who did he beat? Uh, he beat Cote, and then I think he took out Rick Story, and yeah, then there was one, there was um, one there was more one after more that. Matt well. Brown, Matt he, Brown, yeah, he well done, you stopped yeah. Matt Brown in that fight. His stock had never been higher at seventy after stopping Matt Brown. Instantly, just wants to back up again and doesn't give himself enough time, mm. and comes out Story and gets put away. Life, yeah, you know? it, re- it really is too. Like, but there's just no stopping that guy. I no. mean, he's he's always going to do that. That's just what he sort of prides himself on, and really wanted to fight at home too, but. It's another paycheck for him because, from all reports, he loves just like loves to spend his money. So, yeah. I don't know. I just and, he, he could he could have set himself up for to a fight against number two there or something. And you, and you want to talk about like journeyman? You know, Jorge Masvidal has fought at lightweight, has fought in strike force, has fought those backyard <laughs> YouTube videos against Kimbo Slice and oh, shit. I got tagged in one you of know? those on Instagram. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. He's he like put that dude away. thrown down in somebody's like concrete ghetto mm. backyard. Yeah, that's and that's like that Kimbo era where like Kimbo shot to notoriety or whatever. Jorge Masvidal like was in one of those fights with him mm. and hung. Yeah, you know, if you watch it, you know, absolutely <laughs> yeah. hung. Uh, not as hung as not Kimbo, as but <laughs> <laughs> not as hung as Kimbo. Rest his soul, obviously. But he big, big Cuban Masvidal. You can yeah. see him having a big sock. Like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm more referring to he hung well a lot with him on the oh, feet. Of course, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, but um, but yeah, we've got like w- return of one of my. Not one of my my far and away hands down you know favorite fighter of all time this weekend in Anderson Silva you know coming back and we were only discussing today Briss you know if if he gets through Derek Brunson and gets through him in in impressive fashion we got the dash hounds going yeah. off in the background everyone knows their team that. Anderson yeah you hear him they're exactly. chirping about him already yeah. that then mate more than likely title shot. It would have to be. It would have to be for him, like, just because he is in that back nine of his career and he is getting closer and closer towards retirement. And why not give a guy who is who is the greatest of all time, mm. really? Mm. He, uh, he is. I've, I've been critical of Anderson at times, but I still think he is probably the best that's ever done it in terms of just the violent win streak that he went on of just putting everyone away. Exactly. And uh, he w- he's up there, but he probably would... And he lost a really close fight with Michael Bisping, who is the current champion still. So yep. a win here... It would get him a shot, but it's also a dangerous fight too because Brunson is going to come in and just let hands fly. Yeah. Because Br- Brunson, like we were saying with Nganu over Arlovski before, a win like that would do Brunson's stock enormous value. Oh, shit, yeah. Bounce back after the Robert Whitaker fight where and, – and that's the – the real interesting thing about this sort of fight is whether Derek Brunson, because he is a very sort of push forward, aggressive style fighter, and that just plays into mm. a guy like Anderson, who is just a beautiful clinical counter striker, probably one of the best we've ever seen in the sport, up there with Conor McGregor and you oh, know, definitely all those sort of guys. But you know, just eat, eats it up, man. When people charge him like Stefan Bonner did and. Forrest Griffin did and, you know, Vitor Belfort did and all these people that tried, you know, like he just turned him into a highlight reel. Was it was Silver's last fight against Cormier at yes. Yes. light heavyweight? Yes. Yeah, yes. he came in He came in looking a bit soft and, and oh, not mate, totally he got conditioned. Off the, but got off the couch. Yeah, yeah, it was like yeah. six days. He's like, nah, I'll do it. Yeah. He, he didn't he, didn't look the smaller man at all next to Cormier he's though. Six like two. he's a fucking Anderson big dude. Two. Really? You yeah. look at him, you look at him at middleweight and he's like He's not uh, incredibly ripped or anything like that, no. but he obviously cuts a lot of weight to get to mm. He would for out. sure. And uh, in that fight that Anderson did have against DC, he landed the best shot of the fight. He hurt DC to yeah, the body, remember? Yeah, he was yeah. like, DC, sort of, that mic a bit DC there, sort of killed up like, oh, shit. Yeah, but swarmed look, him with a sw- – tried to swarm him and then just got taken down. That's it. I'm going for – I'll go on record and say Anderson will finish him Me this, this weekend. Me I think, too. yeah, if Brunson tries to just wade forward with – Fucking haymakers like he did against Whitaker. Like that fight with Rob Whitaker that he had was so entertaining. Oh, yeah. But uh, if he just is any way reckless, mm. uh, he's waking up with a flashlight. Exactly, in his face. yeah. Like, and and it's, it's a scary sport because, you know, Anderson obviously has been beaten a few times now. And, and you've got a dude who is a young stud, mm. you know, like coming through who is a good fighter. You know, it's a definitely an interesting fight. But 
I, I definitely I'm pulling for Anderson. I know he'll get it done here and hopefully he gets it done in highlight fashion and we can see him contend for the middleweight title again. Are you going to go on record? Put it down? Yeah, put Prediction. it down as a, as a TKO for sure. TKO? For sure, yeah. Um, yeah. By a which front round. kick? <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm going to go, yeah, he'll stop yeah. him via... He, he always stops people with like a whole a flying manner, heel of hook. manner of shit. Yeah. <laughs> flying yeah, heel he goes hook. in for this fucking <laughs> flying heel hook. Yeah. Like, that would be unreal. Um, Holly Holm, will she, she's in the main event against uh, Deronda May. Uh, does Holly become a... Two weight world champion. Oh, is this the the forty five yeah, pound that, title? That's the, the main. That's the main ah, event. Ah, yep. right. I, I'd like to think so. I don't know too much about the other the other lady, but no. um, from the Netherlands, six yeah. and three. Uh, another kickboxer too. So yeah, like, it's, right. it's, it's, it is striker yeah. versus striker here. So and Holly has has had a couple of stumbles of late. Mm, definitely. I mean, she put away put away Ronda and mm. has lost a fight since. Yeah, that's that's sort of how it's gone. And yeah. she lost to Shevchenko, and she lost to uh, Tate. As well, mm. so right, mm. yeah, and she was undefeated up until mm. that point. Eh? That's right, yeah. So well, she's ten and two. Put Ronda away, but you know the writing's on the wall there. Where was that actually an impressive win as we thought it was? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, she is undoubtedly given her resume one of the best female mm. strikers out there, you know. But yeah, she seems to have hit a, a couple of stumbling blocks anyway. Mm. But you know, maybe taking that forty-five pound strap is what she needs. And is this in Austria? Is that where the no, card is? No, no. Fox oh, Sports 3 right. Australia. Yeah. Okay. I was like, it's definitely not in Australia. Like, But um, your boy Nick Lentz versus uh, oh, Islam Makachev Ooh, from yeah, Russia. Right. Is that a, is it, that's at 55? I like that accent. Yes. Yes. New, New Jersey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Austria. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, good day, mate. <laughs> California, yeah. still an all-time Beautiful. classic, oh. isn't it? Funny how movies hold up like that. I just said before we came onto the air, where I watched uh, Ted Danton and Macaulay Culkin in Getting Even with Dad. Yeah, uh, last yeah. night, the <laughs> San Francisco guy who sort of who went to prison and disowned his little eleven-year-old son, and uh, comes back with the son ends up extorting him after he commits this robbery and deadbeat it, dad's it's, yes, back. Exactly, yeah. it still just holds up over time too. That was nineteen ninety-four. Well, it's but, um, it's funny. Do you have any classics like that where you can just watch time and time again and it would just suit? Heaps, man. Shit, Macaulay Culkin for anybody born in the late 80s provided like a lot of really good oh, fucking did, childhood man. movies. God bless yeah. him. And <laughs> that's why I think that even though you, you, you have those conversations sometimes about that you can't really think of anything from your generation that would sort of transcend the next generation. You know how like we like listening to bands of this era and this era and stuff like that. You think about it logically and bands like Nirvana and... Um, you know, a whole bunch of different bands mm. from this era will at one point be in that league, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought about, like, um, th- went and saw Guns N' Roses last night. Yeah, that's right. How was that? At, um, at Cusack Stadium, which is, like, over on the on the south side of Brisbane City, and it's, like, it's a sporting complex, so it's um, it's stadium, not really sure. conducive to music, yeah, necessarily, but they, they sell a bunch of tickets and cram a bunch of people in there. Standing? It's almost like you, you no, nah, we were in we were in a stand like s- seated, but yeah, it's almost like you you basically just watch big screens like at the end of the running track because they're they're too small on stage to really yeah. see. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, fucking Axel turned fifty five on um, Axel Rose, the lead singer, turned fifty five on on Sunday, and uh, yeah, like it's it's kind of bizarre like when you. are you know, you're so famous and all of this creative work that you did was at this certain point in your life and it sort of snap freezes like that image and the the branding of Guns N' Roses and everything like that. But these dudes are like so far past that. They've had like their own internal like, you know, disagreements and all, all sorts of different shit where they, they'd be on stage like, like you could argue for the money mm. and um, it's almost like a, like a tribute band doing themselves a little bit like but um but at the same time man like hand on heart and uh and i've listened to a lot of guitar music like in my life and and seen a lot of live guitar music in my life and uh slash is is the best guitarist that i've ever seen live just insane i I read uh, an article today about uh like the concert from last night at one point that you did like a massive solo during the middle of the concert, was that just next Semi, level? Like seemed like imp- improvised, like sort yeah. of jamish. Like I'm sh- sure it's rehearsed, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that that was kind of what what I noted about it was like, 
you know, these hits that they're playing that you've heard a thousand times, like they're cracking to Sweet Child of Mine and it's all like, it, oh, sa- it, nice. sounds, it sounds on point, you know, like it sounds like it did back then, but because you've heard it so many times, it's, it's, it's almost like not a spontaneous thing, even though music is always spontaneous. But then when Slash and like the bass player do their thing for a bit, it's like that's happening there in that moment and that's like within eye and earshot for you and you're like experiencing that sort of creative happening of, of Slash riffing with like, with, you know, the bass player or whatever. Did you see Wolf Mother? Uh, they didn't play the Brisbane show. Oh, right. They're doing all, all dates except for yeah, Brisbane. That, that They're another one that's got like the same lead singer and, and lead songwriter or whatever who's obviously bought the rights or owns the rights to all the songs and oh. then just fills the rest of the band with session musicians. Yeah, like. right. So they were uh, the other bandmates couldn't put up with him allegedly. Yeah, apparently. Well, he had, d- had he'd, done a, a he'd done a tour with them um, beforehand um, to Australia like recently with a whole bunch of session musicians and, oh. and it got like terrible reviews and stuff like wow. that. But um, are they Australian? What was my yeah. original point? What we what was like? Uh, you were, were talking, talking about Guns N' Roses being the be- one of the best guitarists. No, band. yeah, uh, it was almost like a tribute band being a, watching them do a tribute of themselves. Yeah, I can't remember what question you asked initially though. Mm. Anyway, all the classics came out, but obviously, like the, yeah, yeah, they played a, a, absolutely every single yeah. one of the classics. Like, so you wouldn't have been disappointed if it, it's such a weird type of like a type of demographic because they've become this thing now where it's like, it's like going to the carnival. You go to Guns N' Roses. It's not like going to a music gig. They're that big that they have their own plane. They have like a heap of fucking semi-trailers just full of all their stage equipment and lighting and sound gear and all sorts of different shit. And they're just like these like pampered rock stars. They are like actual roses up there with like wrists and, and chest just covered in ice and fucking... And like jumping around, he had about like six or seven costume changes, like shirt, shirts and hats and different shit, like yep. that he changed in and out of. I just felt bad, like he's he's fifty five and he's he's got these fucking cowboy boots on, man, that just look like they were stiff as fuck. And he's doing the whole like three hour gig, like running around the stage, sending it, jumping up on speaker stacks and shit like that. And I'm just looking at him in these boots, like fuck, that's got to be bad <laughs> yeah. for his back, like. Uh. That's like an OH&S issue, yeah. man. Just get some New Balance or some shit. Do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> do you reckon yeah, that's Change the style up a little bit. Uh, Go. Axel and his sneeze. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of but Slash, really Slash is there in a pair of Vans. He's not silly. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's but be a that, that dude, man, you, you're just looking at him like this this monolithic fucking rock star mm. slash he's got to be a hundred years old Did and he, he just the top hat on yeah well that's the thing man he, he's ageless with his big mirrored aviators and his nose ring and his curly hair all over his face and the big top hat and mm. and just like tattoos and sort of a big dude like mm. and uh <laughs> it's just crazy to think how how many fucking war stories that oh, dude would have like the the life been. that he would have led my um uh, Carl Steven a, a good friend of the knockoff was the one who who offered me the offered me the ticket so um we went together and he remarked that um about um reading Slash's autobiography and saying that he like back in the day he those leather pants that he's wearing he just fucking spend like six days straight in him he wouldn't get out of him he'd piss himself and all sorts of shit and i was just looking at him up on stage in like the jeans that he's wearing just thinking about what a what a slimy like or not slimy but you know what i mean like that dirty rock star lifestyle for decades man and battle hardened battle hardened you know like fucking we're talking proper bottles of alcohol per day you know he'd be at the back having a whiskey before he comes out on stage or whatever like every night that's what i was wondering i was wondering like the sobriety levels of the of the different band members and what they partake in but um Kyle was saying that in the autobiography, I was because I was like, "Oh, what drugs was he into?" And he's like, "Fucking everything, everything man! Like yeah. he'd, he'd do heroin and all sorts of shit." But he just comes out on the other side, and just because he's like got this insanely given talent to just be able to shred on this instrument, mm. he's like he's living this fucking insane lifestyle where he's flying around in his own private jet and. You know, we, we were like remarking as we were walking out and we had to walk to fucking Sunnybank Plaza to get picked up like about 2K hike after the gig and shit with everybody else leaving this fucking Cusack Stadium. And um, fucking 
Yeah, and, the, and and I was like, you know, what do you reckon they would be doing after the show right now? And it's just like, can I get a massage? Like, you know, bring me bring me mm. some iced tea. I'll have uh, I'll have bacon eggs and some sushi. Like, mm. definitely, just yeah. just absolute pampered lifestyle. Like, do whatever the fuck you yeah. want. Like, when you, you go back s- to my penthouse at Stanford Plaza, and you're going to send three of your finest. Uh, working girls yeah, around you. Like, <laughs> there'd, there'd be plenty yeah. of that going on too. Oh, like without, a doubt. without a doubt. But you think about like back in the 80s and 90s and shit, that they would have just had that like insanely thrown at them, you know? Like yeah. you, he- you hear of stories of, of rock stars going to, you know, a certain hotel in, in downtown Los Angeles because they got a week off tour and it's just like let's – Let's get Bunk as many, like, mm. you know, drugs and hotel rooms as we can and just fucking go nuts, like... Mm. It's and you would have the money too, too. Like all yeah. those sort of that era of of rock and roll that you're talking about, like sort of that Metallica, Guns and Roses, you know, all those sort of bands in their prime would have just had so much money yeah. and popularity mm. behind them. What yeah, but it becomes really synonymous with yeah. hedonism and just yeah. like you know to the nth degree, like living out fucking yes. on the edge, doing doing absolutely every pleasurable thing in the book. Rolling you know? TVs into pools and you know. <laughs> that sort of stuff you I'm know i'm gonna say instinct. it was motorhead that um were having a competition uh, on on the road doing the a bass player for uh just as an aside the bass player was wearing a, a lemmy fucking oh, from motorhead shirt no, last yeah, night yeah all yeah. into him like hetfield yeah. on when he was on joe rogan gave lemmy like huge props and stuff but i was I'm gonna to say it was that band. It might be one of the like a band similar to that but from definitely from that generation uh on tour all sorts of drugs and alcohol each night and the band members had a competition of who could go the longest without a shower and still get their dick sucked. Oh. There, was a, there was a dude dead. One of the guys, <laughs> one of the band ranked. members was at like day 23, like just bragging <laughs> back groupies, like, yeah, work at day 23, getting around without a shower and chicks still keen to get on the end of it. Like, yeah. And, and I actually, you know, it's funny, yeah, like the, the, the male brain, I thought of that when Kyle was telling me about the genes for six weeks. I'm like, surely he was getting pussy in that oh, time. Every, every <laughs> night, every wow, night. Yeah. He could still, he'd still have the pulling of power. Like, oh, unbelievable. Absolutely. Oh, that's what I mean. Absolutely. Like, I was like, that's fucking disgusting, man. That means he probably hasn't wiped his ass properly for, for, a, for a week. It's not glamorous at all. No. But Up there on drugs and alcohol, just <laughs> farting into yeah. his pants, into, into his leather pants. Like, if they were clean, you'd see it fog up. But. Just full like, sweat dripping from his gooch, like during those performances. And Come eat this ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Just lining up for the rusty uh, trombone. He, would, he would, wouldn't even Rustiest be asking. Of trombones. Oh, <laughs> it would be awful, awful rusty, that's for sure. It needs some, some, some fucking WD-40. <laughs> burr, 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 burr. <laughs> God oh, damn. Get the it. life of a rock star. But yeah. how, how incredible But I think be? my original point was like the ageing rock stars thing, you yeah. know, like how it's kind of strange now to see them all at 55 and they're, mm. and they're, so, and they're, they're past that lifestyle now. Mm. All of them would, would be like, you'd think living more turned down <laughs> lifestyles Definitely. as the... Um, as the effects of aging and stuff like that became sort of more, you know, you became aware of it in your consciousness, you know, every day you're like, oh, this is, you know, getting harder and harder and more painful to live. We got got Frank just uh, protecting the house. To listen to folks, sorry Uh, about that. (laughs) Um, But on on that sort of like, I guess, line of, if you had like a pill for, you know, which was the fountain of youth or whatever and the – toll on your body and the physical sort of repercussions of that lifestyle didn't matter because you could, you know, maintain your your health and longevity and youth and all that sort of stuff. Would you live that lifestyle pretty hard, do you think? Like if you could? Live the like the partying lifestyle yeah, but still Yeah, um, like just get get rotten rotten drunk and just get, you know, absolutely to the gills on sort of all manner of things and you just never have to pay the consequences mm. for it. Cause so if there was like no ever any hangovers or come downs or oh, anything. Oh no no no. Oh, there no, was, but they just have a longevity pill basically. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um no. If you had have asked me five years ago, I would have said yes, but now, yeah, no, no, exactly. d- definitely not. It would be hand- handy to know if you did have that sort of that sort of blowout effect where it wasn't really going to do any damage but um yeah no nah, still still probably wouldn't uh, i wonder if um if like an extremely large amount of money would change that like if you became really really wealthy mm. and you just started sort of consuming more and and yeah. working less until you were just like oh like and then you just got that that snowball effect where all of a sudden you were like you know 
had a room full of hookers doing blow with Dan Bilzerian or something like that. Well, that's it. I mean, imagine having like multi Dan Bilzerian sort of money in the bank that you would, whenever you had your, your friends over or, or whatever, if it was even remotely dull, you know that you could jump on, make one... Generate f- fun with money. Yeah, yeah, one phone call and you can have, you know, 15, you know, blue chip, Blue chips there, plus a, a big bag of yay, and you know, like, and, and just <laughs> fucking. <laughs> lot of that's hook, gonna, lot that's of gonna be the title. Yeah. That's gonna be the title of this uh, hookers in a big podcast. bag of yay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't even hookers. It was blue chips yeah, in a big chip. bag of yay. <laughs> episode twenty two. <laughs> but you, you you could, and it wouldn't mm. be insignificant, you know. And the Dose, the, ma- the, maju- <laughs> the main driver behind the. The holding back of that sort of partying lifestyle, I would say, would be the financial one. Because a lot of people, if you were just sort of sitting around and you could, and it was like the case of spending, you know, $2 or whatever mm. to have that sort of party on hand at any given time, you would. You no, know? it's it's definitely a, 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 a health feeling issue for me. Yeah. The, the hangovers or the come downs and stuff like that, that's fucking awful type. You know, if you've, if you've had, is. even if you've had excess of the sugar can give you a come down, you know, like you can, mm. you can have a huge night drinking rum and Coke and all of a sudden you've drank 24 cans of Coke, mm. you know, oh, and, and yeah. you would never do that on a regular night. And then, and then you're having all sorts of withdrawals the next day and it's just, oh, it's like too, too taxing for me as I get older, like as a, as a younger man, like you say, Briss, I was, um, you know, able to hang more, but, um, I guess, yeah, it's like, like the aging process, it, it happens to everybody and you can't sort of aim up as hard as you as you could back in the day. But, you know, the likes of Dan Bilzerian, he's he's sort of mid thirties, pushing mm. forty almost. Mm. Like so you can you can redline your body and some and some people just have that capacity, you know. I've I've known people's fathers that have been, you know, able to able to go for days still, like and uh and just chronic alcoholics and different mm. things like that that you know, it's fucking, it's whatever the individual body can take, really. I yeah. guess. Yeah, and 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 some people get a better roll of the dice than others too. You know, some people can live that hard, hard lifestyle for you know up until a ripe old age of you know eighties and nineties. But you know, and then other people sort of live it and you know, and then croak it real early. You know, due to cirrhosis of the liver and all that sort of stuff as well. So. You That's definitely. Murdoch. Murdoch. Yeah, the liver, Murdoch. liver, liver, liver. liver. <laughs> <laughs> Who's hospitalized with cirrhosis of the liver, <laughs> liver, <laughs> liver. <laughs> Simpsons quote for everything. <laughs> you had um, said off air you had an animal intelligence tale. Oh yeah, yeah, man. I heard a um, uh, on that subject of intelligent animals. I was listening to a podcast the other day that uh, was talking about the intelligence of raccoons. That they're just they. There was this big, big field in um, in Guadalupe, which is like this island off sort of Puerto Rico, which has all the big white sharks and a whole bunch of like really indigenous, you know, flora and fauna that's over there, mainly flora. But um, so anyway, they had this um, species of raccoon over there and, and they grow watermelons, like the world's biggest watermelons in this field. These watermelons can grow up to 12 kilos. And, um, and then all of a sudden... In their fields, they st- like they would start coming out, and in the morning they would have like a little hole bored into the side of the watermelon, and all the insides of the watermelon had been eaten out. And they figured out that it was raccoons that were um, that were eating these watermelons. So they originally um, like put fences up so to keep the raccoons out or whatever. But the raccoons like broke branches and like created bridges between the like the 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 trees and the fence and then like walked themselves in and and just pretty much got in that way and then so they pretty much um tried doing like playing music which didn't scare them off at all like they would just come in when the music was there they also tried putting dogs in there the raccoons still broke into the fence killed the dogs they found the dogs in the morning like with their insides on the outsides like they just mauled these dogs so not only were they intelligent but they were ruthless as well and then they um uh and then they put these traps out because they wanted to trap them and move them elsewhere and um the raccoons literally like went into the compound grabbed these traps and like took them outside the fence again and they found them hundreds of metres away from their property all bent up and smashed, that the raccoons just pretty much destroyed these traps. How, how crazy is that? 
Or was it someone from the village that was like, nah, I'm digging these raccoons. And like, yeah. the hu- humans moved it away and they thought it was the raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they, they hit these people up and they were sort of um, about, well, surely you would just want to like kill them. Like, why don't you just put, you know, poisons out for mm. them or, or shoot them or, or whatever. And like, because these, like the, the native like Guadalupian people or whatever, just see the, the raccoon as like almost like a... a national sort of like animal sort of mm. thing they're like well why would you do that like they didn't even understand what they were talking about when they were talking about harming them they were just like they're just eating the watermelons you know like sure it's one third of our profits but it's not worth like killing mm. these animals over i think i've seen a video of a, a raccoon like attacking some dude's dog mm. and then the dude comes down to defend his dog and then the raccoon attacks him or something like that they're pretty fucking gangster those yeah, things yeah they would be real yeah. gangster Real gangster. Somewhat similar maybe to sort of possums if you had to draw some sort of parallel to an Australian animal. But they, yeah. they're they like crafty as fuck at, at jacking your, your veggies and stuff like mm. that if, if you grow anything in the backyard. but And, and people like poison them as That's well. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I think if you ever watch it like any form of cartoon, the raccoons, maybe it's because of that black stripe over their eyes, but... Raccoons are always the bad guy. Yeah, you know, like they're always the <laughs> villain. like the villain who's like you know. There's probably someone. there's go, there'd be something to that though, you know. Like it's Maybe. like the hyenas in the fucking cartoons yeah, are always, always the the, bad guys. the the pack sort of scavenger like yeah. coward type hunters and shit. Yeah, How and uh, that's um, indicative of their nature. South Park have a uh, an episode, a two part episode where Cartman is on there and he dresses up as a he's the superhero. He's like the anti-villain sort of thing, but he dresses up as a raccoon. <laughs> and you know how they just tiptoe along, like the f- walk a very fine line. Those guys. His big, his big thing is like, <laughs> every town needs a hero, every town needs a coon. Like, <laughs> like oh, such a slippery slope from those guys, oh. but they just do not give a fuck. You're either. right, man. They absolutely make a, a complete career out of walking that mm. tightrope be- between inappropriate What's, and appropriate. Would they have an enormous? Uh, legal administration behind them, yes, like they would, yes, they would have they to do. have the elite of the elite going into bat for them, and it would almost be a fun job as a part of that legal team. Like, all right, what are people going to come up with this yeah, now? Yeah, because and we know there's something coming. There's there's an interview with them in in some fucking doco or show or whatever where they um, hit him up about that, and and they to use the example that. Uh, the episode that they did where Tom Cruise wouldn't come out of the closet, they, yeah. they, they pretty much, you know, said that they had to run that past their legal team and, and were pretty much like, well, you can't c- come out and just call him gay. Like, mm. de- definitely don't come out and just call him gay, you know, but um, can we say he's, you know, he's this, that and the other thing? No, you can't say that. Could we say that he won't come out of the closet? Um yeah, I suppose you can <laughs> say that, you know? like I mean... And well, when uh, um, Isaac Hayes, the... Uh, Chef. Um, chef and uh, and soul singer as well, like um, turned Scientologist. He uh, he like as part of an outcry, outcry against the show or whatever, like left oh. and, and was the voiceover character. So they just spliced up all recordings that they had of him in this last episode and made him like he had been kidnapped by a bunch of child molesters <laughs> and they were into molesting children. And then at the, then at the end, they kill him with like wild animals in a pit and like te- yeah. tear him to pieces and stuff Betray like him that. as a pedophile and then just tear <laughs> him to pieces. It's bad. Yeah, because he left. Like, <laughs> he's only been working for him for 15 uh, years or whatever. Like, no, nah, I'm out, guys, under the bus. Like, uh, and it's like it's obviously edited with that sort of stop-start footage, like yeah. stop-start audio. So yeah. they've done that on purpose to yeah. say this That's is what we've funny. done. He's always, like, he was always the... The like romanticist in there, so he's got heaps of songs about making love and stuff like yeah. that. So he'd be like, I want to make love to your children. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh no, no. One of, one of these funny bits out of um, <laughs> Family Guy that I only watched, I watched a couple of early season uh, episodes of Family Guy the other day. He was there, Peter Griffin goes for this, uh, for a job interview, and he's sitting there and he's like the fella interviewing him is across the table and he's got all his desks set up and he's got like photos of his family and stuff and he's like, so Peter, if uh, where can where can you see yourself in 10 years? And he's like, you see his like brain just start working. He looks at the family photo and he's like, it's got his wife and his two children there and he's like, don't say doing your wife. Don't say doing your <laughs> wife. And he goes, uh, doing, your, doing your son. <laughs> oh, I was like, uh, th- this interview's over. <laughs> Have a guess at what um, Trey Parker's worth, his net worth. Is that one of the South Park? Uh, he, he's the yeah. main, Trey, Trey is the main sort of 
uh, craftsman behind it, I think. M- Matt Stone would have a smaller share. Um, but bouncing. 200 mil? 30 or 40? 350. Ooh, oh shit! I knew really? it would be big. I thought I That's went a bit huge. over there. Huge, three fifty mil. That's so big. They're, they're still selling out. Years later, they're selling out Broadway every night for that Book of Mormon that those two wrote. Right, like they're still right, right. Through all the Comedy Central, they're up to wow. season twenty-two of uh, South Park. Yep. Oh, so, so they're still making them. Oh, yeah. wow. Matt, Matt Stone's wow. worth three hundred million. Oh, he's not. Wow. He's not too far behind. Wow. Yes, <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, that is incredible. Talking almost a billion dollar industry I, on the. Uh, on the back of just goofiness, mm. like yeah. on the back of just straight, pure, fun imagination. You they know? would have cut so many corners early on with the uh, illustrations as well. Like yeah. so fucking yeah. basic, man. <laughs> yeah. Little cardboard cutouts just walking into their primary school. Uh, mm. pretty, pretty simple. Yeah. Well, they're 47 and 45 now. And, um, you know, like that movie Basketball, I think, would have been somewhat indicative of probably their high school experience of being the outsider and not, like, accepted and being kind of a bit of yeah, a loser playing yeah, yeah. playing Nintendo still at 19 or, or whatever, like... They've got, um... They're having the last laugh. <laughs> yeah. 350 million? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Dan Bilzerian That's, and some. Oh, yeah. That yeah. incredible amount. That's lifetimes of cash. Oh, yeah. You could never, ever spend that much Give money. Give us a uh, look at uh, Matt Groening. What's he? Uh, the Simpsons head guy. What's he? Uh, he'd be more than oh, that, I'd say. Oh, yeah. He'd, he'd, he'd be, be eight, I want to say 700. Maybe. 500 million. Oh, <laughs> South Park keeping <laughs> like... Shit. Uh, they're $150 million behind him, yeah. but in the scheme of things, it's That's a, incredible. 500 and, and, mil. And imagine like like what I was saying before about the, you know, off just pure fun and imagination. Imagine having that imagination mm. where you just come up with that sort of rude humour always and you can come up with it beautifully timed and well written and well scripted and just like imagine even being like a guy like Roald Dahl and just being able to sit down and having that much imaginative content that just comes through your head all, at all times that it, you've got like an endless supply mm. of it, you know? Mm. It'd be nuts. Yeah, I, lo- I fucking love Roald Dahl. That, <laughs> that dude's like one of the most prolific authors of all time or definitely of the of the modern era, man. He, he wrote so many fucking books and stories. Mm. But like definitely all a certain sort of type like I was even, I think I was at the grocery store the other day and there was this dude there that was like straight out of a Roald Dahl novel, eh? Like had like all the nostril hairs coming out and I could just like, I could hear the Roald Dahl cadence describing <laughs> this guy as I'm looking at him, like the BFG or something. Like. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good read, that. Yeah. Oh, I think they just made like a Hollywood movie, didn't they? Did they? Yeah, True. like yeah. a kid's movie. How, how much would he be worth? Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl. Oh, well, I guess it'd be his, his, yeah, his, yeah, his empire state. sort of thing. 45,000 like, back in the day. Probably not very much, man. Like, Because in the early days of him selling his mm. books, he'd sell probably more books now. He'd yeah. make more from his books now, surely, in death. Than it says 10 million. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't have thought it would have been. Yeah, back when he's selling books for $1.80. Oh, and exactly, like that, mate. Probably. Exactly. He'd have probably just been, you know, paying his paying his wages. Mm. That That's, you know, he, he'd... He, he's dead now, but, I mean, he would have... I mean, I think we've talked about that maybe on a previous potty, but where he's, like, well, in his 80s or something when he died and he's already gone. Mm. You're so. looking at uh, progressing into the world of tattoos. How's that How's yeah. that coming along? Yeah, man, good, good. Anyone, any artists you want to give a shout-out? Uh, probably, like, the, the guy that I'm going to get get it done from is a guy called Jeffrey Mendoza, who's, um, who's over in LA. I've also been um, taught... Toying with there's a guy on Instagram called Junker, which like um is the there's a crazy chest piece that like I sent you, you guys the other day that um I'd love to potentially like have one section of it done by him, but then that Jeffrey Mendoza guy seems to collage pieces together better for sleeves sort of thing rather than just sort of like one big artist's sort of you know. Michelangelo, ha- yep. the whole way down your arm type or art arrangement. So um, I don't know. I'll probably get it all done from this Jeffrey Mendoza guy. Yep. But um, be a cool experience going internationally for it as yeah. well. How how would you sort of plan that out? Just back to back days or twice in a week or something? I, I reckon I would try and time it with the end of my holiday coming home because I'm I'm planning on doing a, a bit of a surfing holiday and I think the last thing that I want to do is get the tattoo and then for it to spend three months in the sun mm. straight up after that going surfing every day. Yeah. So I think no it's probably way. best to 
by the time I'm coming home, it'll be about, you know, like winter time here anyway. So, you know, get it at the end of the, the trip and then come home with it. And then it's got all winter to heal because it's all covered up. So it's nothing but curl bar until summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be more expensive, man, yeah. if you make your arms bigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them little yeah. and puny, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you want it, we'll have some sort of product. We're actually giving the uh, Alpha Brain by on it a, yeah. a trial run here on the body. This is f- my first experience into it. Mm. It is hot in the studio, so I do have a bit of a natural sweat going. Me too. But I heard that that was a, one of the uh, not so much a side effect, but one of the uh, things where it did make. Yeah, uh, apparently, if you're a sweaty bloke naturally, it might enhance that a yeah. bit more. But and and for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, it's 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 like a nootropic or something. I think they call it. Alpha Brain rubbing their fucking hands together yeah, right now, yeah. son. So if you're, look, if you're looking <laughs> yeah. for a sponsorship, shout. <laughs> Out, knock mm. off, hashtag us, and we'll uh, we'll hook it up. Chris is already sponsoring you guys yeah, with definitely. pretty much yeah. every product oh, on your website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, absolutely. Hey, Aubrey, Chris here bought your uh, family's Christmas presents for this year. <laughs> Dick liquor. <laughs> <laughs> you can thank me later, yeah. Aubrey. <laughs> uh, There's a guy who's kicked some goals with his uh, his business, mm. hasn't he? He's really got that off the ground to to his credit. Yeah, so. started out hats, hats selling off. flashlights or something. Apparently. That's right. Yeah, yeah. he's a big mar- in the part of the marketing crew for flashlight or yeah. something along those yeah. lines. Oh, so time. that was how the affiliation with the Joe Rogan podcast correct. came about. Yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Sponsored by a Flashy. Like once, uh, once he really blew he's up, he sort of ditched that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, did, he ditched that a little bit once he really blew up. Like, uh, f- first entry on the resume. Like. Have, have either of you ever fucked a flashlight or, or something equivalent? I've owned one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've owned Giving one. Giving it a go. What's yeah. it like? A, a legitimate flashlight or a yeah, pro- proper brand, uh, uh, modelled off a uh, pornographic film star, uh, like it was her yeah. replica or whatever yeah, that they yeah, do, yeah. and um, it was um, it was good, but at the same time, it was quicker to just provide yourself with your own hand relief yeah, and, and a lot less yeah. messy as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, that's the, it. The, yeah. I've, fe- I've felt one before, mm. but um, it's. I don't think the technology is advanced enough for, no. it, for it not to be just like this. That's nah. right. Look, it, it's good, but... stimulating thing. When you have to go to the bathroom and look yourself in the mirror as you're undoing, <laughs> yeah. uh, as you're, as you're undoing the screw cap, like uh, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of eye contact going on, that's for sure, at that time. So it, it is more just convenient if you are just looking... F- Cleaning for that stress relief, the second oh, shit, like, that's oh. it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, at, look at yourself in the mirror. You're better than this, that's man. <laughs> <laughs> just get get to that Tinder account, yeah, man. Like, yeah. start start chasing. Like, this yeah. is pathetic. You're slipping. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we, we were only discussing that the other day as to just how funny it is that that guys are really that sort of type of human being that really oh actually that's bullshit man did you know that the the vibrator for women was originally invented by um like psychologists to uh to cure hysteria in women because that yeah absolutely <laughs> they just needed a good dicking that's it man yeah <laughs> look that up they, they, they um they absolutely used to, they invented the dildo to um to cure women of hysteria who, which is like this condition back in sort of, I suppose, the early 19th century somewhere. Um, and, and yeah, just needed a good dick in. Like they just, you know, gave him a good going <laughs> over with the, the dildo or whatever. And that was like the treatment for, for hysteria at the time. Classic. But ironically, men's sexual pleasure was the furthest thing from the minds of the male doctors who invented vibrators almost two centuries ago. They were interested in a labour-saving device to spare their hands the fatigue of... They had developed giving hand jobs to steady a stream of 19th century ladies who stu- suffered hysteria. Yeah. A vaguely devi- defined a- ailment easily recognisable today as sexual frustration. <laughs> <laughs> so that all these se- uh, seedy doctors just invented dildos so they could just be like jamming these birds like as treatment. How, how, fucking, Far, yeah. how funny is that, man? Like, the, and and considering how widely used dildos are in in today's, you know, in today's <laughs> world, they complain to doctors of anxiety, sleeplessness, irritability, nervousness, erotic fantasies, feelings of heaviness in the lower ab- abdomen, and wetness between the leg. This is the syndrome that became known as hysteria, <laughs> 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 from the Greek for uterus. Yeah, crazy. Crazy. So mm. it's like, yeah, it's 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 intrinsic to the biology. It's like mm. everybody needs a good fucking. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It's like this is the medicine. You know, this is a condition. We've got a problem with it. 
you know, let, let's create a dildo yeah. and let's, you know, wail on these birds and problem solved. They've been medicated. Uh, <laughs> I've got what ails you. Like. <laughs> so oh, arrogant. Yeah. It's like, oh. it's so indicative of men's like fucking <laughs> psyche to the world. Constantly. You know what she needs? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Invented oh by a man, no surprises. Yeah, no yeah. surprises there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. But yeah, I mean, in I guess you know the that crea- sing- creation pretty much single handedly shaped masturbation for females. Mm. You know, long, long term, chicks are still using dildos now. Oh yeah, and and like I'm sure. If you did like a po- a proper you know survey of the the demographic of the population of how many women who have owned a, a vibrator of some description mm. or or used Ooh, one or much fucking all, I reckon. yeah or it would be, sta- be some, staggeringly majority. There'd be some prudes out there that would ne- yeah, never, never, never would before. Like, oh no, I, I, for I sure the Bible Belt that, and but, uh, like yeah. Mm. Definitely. Maybe a lot of is- Islamic countries and stuff, but Definitely. maybe not. Maybe That's not. Maybe there's the va- a lot of... The vast majority would, and there's no shame in that too. Some people feel that there's this stigma around yeah. masturbation. Or it's no way. No, like well, a- that's like, that's the thing, you know. Like, the, legit, these women were complaining of, you know, sleeplessness and anxiety, mm. and, and that is like, sex alleviates a lot yeah, of that, that feeling, like, you know. I heard a, a story out of a... Uh, IVF clinic, and this was all just alleged as well. But there was a wives, whether it was a wives' tale or actual true story, where these a couple were having trouble conceiving, so they've gone to an IVF clinic and paid their paid ten thousand to to conceive conceived, uh, and the lady had it had terminated the baby because she'd found out the husband had masturbated to the pornographic magazines mm. in this in this building. Mate, I can remember. Yeah, yeah. Oh, if if that is true. Shame yeah. on you, girl. Like, oh, how I, that's just wrong. Like, I've, I've got a buddy who, um, who dated this girl in would have been, yeah, I suppose it would have been like late high school, also like through you know 18, 19, sort of early university. I think they they also sort of dated, and now would have definitely been post school, so 18, 19. Um, and and she was like that, didn't didn't like him looking at porn, you know, and I, I think that, that that's sort of almost irresponsible for for t- chicks to take that stance with with guys that you know like i get that it's sort of something that is difficult for you to wrap your head around giving you you know your hormones and what whatnot but like trying to rob guys of of watching porn is just not where your interest should lie you know it's it's absolute some people get addicted to it like anything i guess and and it fucks your shit up but you know, every dude should be able to, you know, just not have to have an imagination. Yeah, so so, um, so readily available in this day and age too. I think that's the that's the thing where mm. it is almost unavoidable at times too. There's so many blokes out there would be just pounding the tube sites. Like yeah, like yeah, exactly. Targeted marketing. You're trying to trying to do something on the internet, and all of a sudden, like something pops up in your browser. Yep. It's like the man can't control himself. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of the. Uh, Knockoff Nation, I know they're probably hanging around the tube sites a little bit. <laughs> they would be for sure. There, would, <laughs> yeah. there wouldn't be a knockoff nation member <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that hasn't that. gone to a porn site today. <laughs> <laughs> Segwaying beautifully uh, into uh, this week's we edition you. of uh, Under the Bus. So. <laughs> I'm calling out 170 pound world champion Tyron Woodley. Uh, <laughs> some of his sort of online etiquette around racism and things like that this this guy too uh, undeniable that he, he's from ferguson in st louis missouri so he is from a hard background and there's i'm sure there has been times unfortunately for him that he has been discriminated against racially yeah uh, li- living in that hotbed over there i could guarantee you that that's happened to him in his life it wouldn't be but now I, though no but but i think he's saying that he's sort of a he's not paid as much uh because he's african-american things like that and when it comes to the UFC where you look at some of the most marketable stars in history in this sport mm. have been of black descent. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's ways – you've got to get bums on seats to sell fights mm. and I think whether it's his advisors in his corner or whether Tyron himself isn't enough – intelligent enough to articulate, to articulate it the way he wants to – uh, I, th- I think there's something something missing there, which makes him look bad. But mm-hmm. it's not not the best look for him, and I don't think he r- is int- intentionally coming across wanting to come across that way. But 
on the MMA hour with Ariel Hawani, there was Ariel asked him a question along the lines of, you know, like, do you have any examples and stuff? He goes, well, you know, people come up to me and say, hey, hey, Tyrant, you're so well spoken. And he's like, what, for a black man? And it's like, no, yeah. no, it's that, that person there's just paying you a compliment because you are well spoken and you've got yourself a presenting gig on Fox because you can put two words together. Mm. And he also said in the commentary too, he mentioned that, um, he goes, you're in the commentary they've said, Geez, I'm explosive and don't have cardio, and that's Joe Rogan that's been yeah, that's been absolutely. doing that. He, he said that multiple multiple times, well, but yeah. he says that about Hector Lombard and guys like that too. Yeah. So it's not only isolated to Tyron, yeah, but he does have that muscly physique. He's saying that he's like, what? So you're saying I don't have I'm, I don't have cardio because I don't work hard because I'm black. Mm. And you're like, no, I think you're off the mark there a little bit, Tyron. Like, there's time, as I said, there would have been times where he has been discriminated against, and that's not right, but. He's, he's now the UFC world champion and he's sitting next to Dana White at the Super Bowl. Mm. So, come on, guy. I don't think you've got it that rough. He's, he's a real From the business standpoint. Yeah, he's a real bleeding heart man, you know? Like, everything with him is always so, some sort of, you know, issue with something, you know? And it seems like... I, I don't know whether it's his tactic to play that to try and, mm. you know, get the UFC to give him more money, but you're dead right. It's all about... You know, getting bums on seats, defending that strap, defending it in impressive fashion, and you know, and then selling big fights. Dead you know? right, dead you know, right. Get on, get on the mic and call someone's yeah, name out. Yeah. Create beef that way rather than sort of coming out. And like I said, I just don't think he is articulated enough to to really get it across. But I think he does get that um, that Conor McGregor model in terms of you know he's actively sought out that Michael Bisping fight. He was actively seeking out that, you know, Conor McGregor fight. He is just... Uh, he's obviously just open to the big money fights mm. and a lot of fighters are these days. They're seeking those out, you know. They want that that big, you know, <clears throat> big chunk of change even if it's a, a, a tough fight, you know. Definitely. Put it this way, he's got me because I'm tuning into his next pay-per-view yeah, when he's yeah. going to fight Wonderboy Thompson mm. so I can hopefully see Wonderboy sleep him. You know oh, what I mean? So he yeah. buys in. Whether people either want to buy fights because they're supporting the person, exactly. or they want to see him get their ass kicked. That's yeah. sort of how this combat sports work, isn't it? Oh shit, yeah, man, absolutely. Um, did you on, on combat sports as well? Before we get to you under the bus, did you see any of Mundine Green for all those I, Aussie I, combat fans I, out there? I, I watched the highlights. I didn't, you know, care about it enough to mm. to probably tune in and watch yeah. the the pay per view yeah. or anything. Wasn't getting my sixty bucks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that they they debated the decision, but what was more sort of uh, of a standout for me in that card anyway was that as I don't know if, you, if you've seen the photos online but you know qu- that Quade Cooper and yeah. and who Jack Innes or whoever mm. the fuck he fought on the undercard was just a disgrace you know that that's what's wrong with boxing is that they pad out records with these nobodies like just they crush mismatches. yeah miss horrible mismatches where they just crush cans for about 15 20 fights yep. just to get that 20 and 0 record because you kind of you need that yep. to be able to sell fights this the jack, jack the who got put away by quade in the first round Kyle Stephen has got a bit of a history at a boxing gym in Brisbane he showed me a fight he came over to watch the super bowl on monday and showed me a fight of Mark Bam Bam Flanagan, who trains out of his gym, who's now Australian champion. Right. Hitting Jack Innes to the body at Mansfield Tavern with this body rip that just put him away in a second. So that guy has fought an Australian champion. As mm. Talking about padding records. I love having a bet every now and then on sports. So I like to like put, put together a multi. From that card, out of, out of the fights that were on there, such a fucking joke, the fact that they had... Um, Six or seven of the fights, the favourite was paying under a dollar oh five on the tab. So if, if you're putting a dollar on, you're getting you get five, five cents, cents back. Oh, so just gross why, mismatches why like that. You, you couldn't, you couldn't mm. have a bet. Like I ended up having a bet on the Green Mundine fight to not go to a decision. So I ended up doing mm. my dough there. But that was about the only variety that you could have on that on no that one, card in general. No one particularly got like badly rocked in that fight, mm. did they? No, oh, Green did at the start because yeah, it, because okay. they he had his back turned and the referee called break like. I'm not even at that up to speed with the technicalities of boxing anymore. Mm. With what they ha- when when they do call break and whether you are allowed to throw shots at that time and things like that. So I don't know. If people are calling it a dog shot or whatever, but not intelligent enough to weigh in on yeah, yeah. O- on the exact boxing rules. But Green was badly hurt and had to go sit down in his corner. And the doctor wanted to stop the fight, but I think Green basically begged him to uh, to keep it going. Like wow! All that hype to get knocked knocked out in like a controversial shot. Yeah, wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have been good business. 
for them at all. But I remember uh, that Dan- Danny Green versus um, Roy Jones Jr. fight that um, that that he did where he he just stung him in the mm. first and then just wailed on him and and you know it was like. Probably to this day, Danny Green's biggest victory, oh, you know, in terms of world competition. They don't get any bigger than Roy Jones Jr. Paul Briggs. <laughs> yeah. When he beat Paul Briggs. Yeah. That, the same thing with the fight lasted 10 seconds yeah, or whatever. That was a dive. Yeah, that punched, was yeah. 100% a dive. And Greeny's on the mic like, he's not even a canine. Yeah. Like, he's lower than a dog. Yeah, like, yeah. Called him out and big he, time. And he apologised for that he really though, did, like, yeah, later he, on. He felt terrible, yeah. but... Uh, who have you got to sling under the bus, mate? Mate, my, my under the bus is – it's been, I guess, a, a few weeks since we've done um, – since we've done an app, and, and obviously the whole Donald Trump inauguration thing is, is you know, rife – is fucking Madonna at that inauguration, man. You know, like she is embarrassing herself in terms of – she got up in front of, you know, women – who are protesting for women's rights, who had their kids there and all sorts of stuff and just talked about blowing up the White House and letting go F-bombs and and all that sort of stuff. Like, I mean, who the fuck wants advice from Madonna? All the the while... Who gives a shit, you dirty old lesbian? Shut your mouth. Dead set. She's up there (laughs) preaching a message (laughs) of of love. That's a venomous under the bus this Uh, week. Spitting uh, fire. uh, (laughs) Yeah. But I, I couldn't agree more. She's up there preaching a message of, of love and unity when she's talking about how she was tempted to go and blow up the White House and all while talking about love and unity is repeatedly screaming, fuck you, in, into yeah, the microphone. Yeah, exactly, it's man. Like, bitch, you were just setting, setting women back here, yeah, you idiot. Exactly. Because every male now is sitting back and going... Look at this fucking idiot. Yeah. That, I felt embarrassed for her. Me when too, man. She's Me all too. about... All yes. about <laughs> yes. Got a bit of the audio here. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. Yeah, dumb, dumb bird. Like, I mean, look, I'm, I, everyone knows she's kidding, and and it's not a case of you know that you actually think Madonna's legit in blowing up the White House, but. That's what you prepared. Mm. You, you you were asked to you make make a speech at this this rally or whatever that you'd put together, and that's what you sat down with pen and paper and thought of to mm. write to say to a bunch of people. It's like a, how like incompetent? Yeah, I think it's it's just like the in, inherent problem with putting entertainers on a, on a political pedestal. Mm. It's like these people we're not we're not they're not mega rich and and popular because of their political or social views it's like she's known for gyrating her ass like to pop songs you know yeah. she she offered free blowjobs for hillary voters on her twitter during the campaign yeah, exactly. and you're talking about women's rights when you just <laughs> when you've just objectified yourself to males yeah. out there saying and it is all jokes because she's not going to go blow up the White House and she's certainly not going to suck everyone's dick who yeah. voted for hillary <laughs> maybe but she'd still be yeah, she'd still be there right. but uh. Just I yeah I've, I felt embarrassed for her and I yeah. thought it was one of the most cringeworthy moments where you look at some of the most powerful women in history like the Mother Teresas of the like who would just be rolling in their grave hearing mm. just fucking stupid yeah. talk like that. I think it's just such an interesting time and like a a character like Trump he's such a polarizing person that you know the extreme shit that he comes out with makes the extreme opposing views come out to the nth degree you know and it, and it, all of a sudden it becomes this real sort of hectic argument that's just divided along along really sort of deep lines of gender or culture or whatever it may be but yeah it's it's uh, it's an interesting time for mm, for mm. the human human race on this on this planet that we live in like Definitely. with um with such a polarizing character at the helm of, mm. of one of the biggest superpowers in terms of nation states the biggest yeah. the biggest even you know? even i was reading today about you know people now sort of scholars and things like that discussing the the potential for you know what if australia's alliances with america aren't aren't you know what they continue to be and and what if mm. you know we have to start aligning ourselves more with the places that are closer to us like japan and indonesia and and india and these sorts of places yeah like, but but we as australians know that that's never going to happen you know and i think that's why at least I wouldn't be so sure well yeah. maybe who knows no one knows the direction of it but you know because our our ties with america have gone so long and and the american system refreshes everybody every eight years anyway you can you, that's as long as you can possibly have a term is no president you know is is going to completely burn those bridges with australia you know and australia just know that that 
the reports of Trump don't necessarily reflect the other 350 million. Yeah. The interesting thing that like what I was reading today is though, what is, is, is sort of, you know, Trump's very, he's, he's a business minded person. So it's very much transactional. Like if, if what's in it for us, if, if we're doing a favor to you. So you got to wonder like with military strategy and things like that, what do Australia really have to offer in, in that alliance? Like, you know, for their protection, what what do we really offer? But but we would offer them a lot in terms of access to land in order to have, you know, um, intelligence and stuff like that of countries like China and whatnot. Because we have proximity to them, whether they don't have proximity to them, like they've got big big military bases up in Darwin and all that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. The U.S. Army, you know, so that that it, in a weird way that. The US is able to have that big stick approach on the on pretty much the whole world because it has that insane military presence and it's everywhere, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This article is talking about, you know, the potential for Australia to increase its its uh military budget in order to become more of a you know a help mm. to the system but it's like uh even even if we do we we still pale in comparison you know we, we yeah. we're basically the you know the little little step kid or whatever that that just needs to be carried yeah the old president president trump left the super bowl at 28 points to 3 he's a big patriots fan <laughs> and falcons leading 28-3 pack up the cars boys we're out of here i'm not going to see him go down like this Come back and won. Missed oh, it. Mark really? Wahlberg, huge Patriots fan, being the Boston guy. He Called left. him out. He left. Oh, he's oh. like, no, nah, fuck this, man. This is too hard to watch. Like, I'm not going to see him get Spewing. flogged. Yeah. Left. Missed the greatest comeback of all time. Yeah. yeah. That he'd, was some electric like, Definitely shirt, a lot man. of people leaving Guns N' Roses mm. last night before the encore, which which contained right. most of the hits. Like right. for, Really? For like a, the biggest portion of the um, the set, I didn't know a lot of the songs. Yep. And then uh, they went away and came back and did like a, a four four song um, encore that was like you know Paradise City November Rain oh, right? just just yeah. smashed it it. a lot of uh, a lot of people left like they didn't even fucking yeah play the hits. Like, yeah that's all I came for furious. patience they um oh, patience. They, uh, yeah, great they finished with Paradise City and like all all fireworks went off and everything nice. like stadium gigs like uh, like I ripped on them a little earlier but you know they're they're a different entity like and it was like going to the carnival and it was like it was legit props to Slash mm. those boys would be tearing it down again tonight you know then Sydney get then they get the massage and sushi afterwards yeah, yeah. definitely they, they just literally one night i reckon in brisbane the next night they'd be somewhere else next on night their own plane yeah yeah they got yeah. a guns and roses yeah. plane they had footage of it like touching down in brisbane and yeah. shit big logo on the back they'd just be those that ro- that like you were talking about before that full roadie crew that were driving you know like three b double semis and and as soon as the, the gig was over and it was packed up they'd just be like you need to get this rig to fucking sydney yeah. asap and yeah you know like I dr- reckon drive it through the night, get it there in the next thirteen hours. Here's you know? some of sa- here's some of Slash's gas. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Slash. <laughs> episode t- episode thirty two. That's going to be us, fam. Fucking private jet by by ten yeah, more eps. I reckon sure, definitely. Who's your under the bus, Danny? Uh, I'll finish on a positive note rather than uh, <laughs> throw oh, no, somebody no, under their negative. Man, so you're on the under the bus <laughs> next time. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, thanks for having us, fam. We'll uh, we'll bring you some more content soon. We've got a few guests lined up, but uh, we'll keep you in suspense till then. Be good to each other. Peace. Bye for now.